After plagiarizing a rock icon and giving life to a fictional band, Ringo Starr stormed out of a Beatles recording session and came back with a hit. These are the stories behind every Beatles song featuring Ringo Starr on lead vocals. Ringo Starr's first lead vocal performance was on the band's 1963 debut album, Please Please Me. According to biographer Alan Clayson, the entire album was recorded in a single day to capitalize on the group's rapid explosion in popularity. Boys is a cover song by the popular girl group The Shirelles, which was written by Luther Dixon and Wes Farrell. A fixture of early live performances by the Beatles, Boys was initially sung by former Beatles drummer Pete Best. According to Beatles historian Ian McDonald, Ringo's studio version required only one take to record, indicating the pressure that both the band and producer George Martin were under to get the album tracked so quickly. Though he was the last of the Fab Four to join the group, Ringo also knew Boys well, having performed it with his band Rory Storm and the Hurricanes before joining the Beatles. According to Clayson's biography on Ringo, George Martin was unimpressed by both Ringo's voice and his skill as a drummer at this early stage of his career. Despite the producer's misgivings, Starr's performance on Boys successfully produced a glimpse into the band's energetic stage act in a studio recording. According to the Beatles anthology, when it came time to write and record their sophomore UK album with the Beatles, John Lennon and Paul McCartney made a concerted effort to pen a new song for Ringo that could replace Boys. That song was I Wanna Be Your Man. However, as John Lennon recalled in the Beatles anthology, shortly after writing I Wanna Be Your Man, the Beatles made the acquaintance of up-and-coming rockers the Rolling Stones. As Lennon and McCartney were the world's hottest songwriting duo at the time, the Stones manager Andrew Oldham asked if the pair had a song that they would be willing to let the Rolling Stones record. Lennon and McCartney decided that, though Ringo was soon due to record his version of I Wanna Be Your Man for the upcoming Beatles album, the song would be a good fit for Mick Jagger's group. Their intuition was correct, and it became the Rolling Stones' first major hit a few weeks before Ringo's version was released on With The Beatles. In 2018, Starr told Howard Stern that, since he was so loved by fans, it was generally more important for the Beatles to feature Ringo singing a song on the record, even if that song wasn't exceptionally unique or groundbreaking. But I, how do you know that I Want to Be Your Man is a Ringo song? Who decides that? If I do it, it's a Ringo song. Right. Because it's the way I do it. Cementing Ringo Starr's reputation as a reliable voice for stomping rockabilly numbers, the next Beatles track the drummer took lead vocal duties on was Matchbox, a cover version of a 1957 song by rock pioneer Carl Perkins. Perkins was a major touchstone for the Beatles. In his book Revolution in the Head, the Beatles' records in the 60s, Ian McDonald said that the Fab Four performed 12 of Perkins' songs in their live shows before the release of their debut studio album. Nevertheless, John Lennon openly admits that assigning Ringo another cover song wasn't exactly a celebration of the drummer's vocal ability. In his biography on Star, Alan Clayson quoted Lennon as saying, We weren't going to give him anything great. Perkins happened to be visiting the UK at the time the song was recorded and dropped by during the session to watch Ringo record it. Two decades later, Ringo performed Matchbox alongside Perkins, George Harrison, and Eric Clapton on the 1985 television broadcast Carl Perkins and Friends, a rockabilly session. By the mid-60s, Ringo's bandmates had essentially cemented him as their vocal interpreter for a certain variety of rockabilly songs. Starr didn't seem to have a problem with this at the time, as he mentions in the Beatles anthology that he loved that style of music and that he would regularly sing country songs when performing with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. For this reason, the next Beatles recording that Ringo sang lead on was Honey Don't from the 1964 record Beatles for Sale. Like Matchbox, Honey Don't was a cover of a Carl Perkins number, and like Boys, Ringo was already familiar with the song before he joined the Beatles. According to the Beatles anthology, Ringo claimed that, quote, every band in Liverpool performed the tune, so it made for an easy and straightforward recording session when it came time to track the album. After a few years of making Beatles records, it seemed standard procedure that Starr would be assigned rock and roll covers to sing when it came time for his once-per-album vocal feature. However, by the time recording sessions began for the Beatles' 1965 album Help, Ringo wanted more of a say in which songs he would provide his voice for. As he recalled in the Beatles anthology, Ringo discovered Act Naturally on a record by country music star Buck Owens. He then brought the song to his bandmates, telling them that he believed it was the perfect song for his spot on the new album. They agreed. According to Revolution in the Head, the song was the first cover that the Beatles recorded without perfecting it live in concert first. Ringo and Buck Owens also recorded a duet performance of the song together in 1989. The story of how power struggles within the Beatles eventually contributed to their 1970 breakup has been well documented in rock history. As early as the mid-60s, tensions were already surfacing between the band members, and surprisingly, Ringo was at the heart of these budding conflicts. <laughs> I don't remember any squabbles. You don't remember anything, do you? No. <laughs> According to Ringo Starr, Straight Man or Joker, in the period leading up to the recording of 1965's Rubber Soul, Ringo felt that he was being sidelined from the 
group. John Lennon and Paul McCartney effectively had creative control over all the music at the time, and Lennon, McCartney, and George Harrison were all collaborating with other musicians and beginning to compose music that made Ringo feel like he was disposable. Ringo took his concerns to the band, and to assuage their drummer of his worries, they invited him to sing and provide creative input for the Rubber Soul track What Goes On. Not only would this function as Ringo's lead vocal performance for the seminal album, it was also Starr's first songwriting credits on a Beatles record. The song is spiritually similar to the laid-back Act Naturally, and Ringo still performs it in concert to this day. In 2015, he told CBC News that even though more than half a century has passed since his time in the Beatles, he still doesn't get tired of playing his old hits. Are there any that you say, you know, I've, I've actually heard that enough? No. One of the most memorable songs of the psychedelic 60s, Yellow Submarine is arguably Ringo Starr's starring moment from the Beatles era. Unlike their more hard-edged contemporaries, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles had a broad audience and a family-friendly appeal that they were willing to embrace. According to Ringo Starr, straight man or joker, Yellow Submarine was conceived as a song that would appeal mainly to children, while also celebrating the band's roots in the major port city of Liverpool. Featured on the 1966 album Revolver, Yellow Submarine was a single hit on both sides of the Atlantic, charting at number one in the UK and number two in the US. According to Ian McDonald's Revolution in the Head, the song was primarily Paul McCartney's creation, though he had some uncredited help from folk singer Donovan while crafting the tune's far out lyrics. Despite the popularity of Yellow Submarine, with a little help from my friends is arguably Ringo Starr's signature song, serving as a reflection on his role as the band's mediator and social glue during some of the Beatles' more tumultuous moments. What's more, the song is still a staple of Ringo's live performances today. With a little help from my friends was the second track on 1967's Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band concept album that opens with the Fab Four taking on the persona of a fictional musical group before introducing the character Billy Shears to sing track two. Shears is played by Ringo, who sings the song as the character rather than as himself. In the Beatles' The Authorized Biography, Barry Miles revealed that the song was specially written for Ringo by Lennon and McCartney, who fittingly pieced it together at a piano in front of a small audience of friends. Despite the song's popularity as a Beatles track, it is often associated with English singer Joe Cocker, whose cover of the song hit number one in the UK. He would famously go on to perform it live at Woodstock. Though Ringo Starr isn't renowned for his songwriting, the music and lyrics for Don't Pass Me By, his first solo composition on a Beatles record, came to him quite naturally. In the Beatles anthology, he recalls, I wrote Don't Pass Me By when I was sitting round at home. I only play three chords on the guitar and three on the piano. I was fiddling with the piano, I just bang away, and then if a melody comes and some words, I just have to keep going. That's how it happened. According to the Beatles Bible, Ringo wrote the simple country and western song early in his Beatles career, but it would take until 1968's The Beatles, better known as the White Album, for the track to see the light of day. According to Alan Clayson, there was one very solid reason for Don't Pass Me By getting a pass for so many years. In writing it, Starr had unconsciously plagiarized music from a Jerry Lee Lewis song. It was only in the final years of Beatles' career, when they and producer George Martin were experimenting with orchestration and studio effects, that they were able to tweak the song enough to avoid a potential lawsuit. In many ways, Good Night has a sound unlike any other song the Beatles ever recorded. The grand finale of the White Album, it's a sweet and tender lullaby rendered into an epic through cinematic orchestration. As Ian McDonald notes in Revolution in the Head, Good Night was penned by John Lennon as a bedtime song for his son Julian, who was five years old at the time. According to Rolling Stone, Lennon was evasive in explaining his intentions behind the song. He was adamant that Ringo should sing the piece instead of him, perhaps feeling that Starr would provide a more cuddly presence of what is essentially a children's song. Lennon had also already shown his sensitive side on the album with the ballad Julia, a track he wrote for his deceased mother. It's possible that he may have felt too emotionally exposed singing two soft, sweet songs on one album. The song is something of an anomaly in the Beatles' catalog, as no Beatle apart from Ringo performs on it. The rest of the music was played by session musicians directed by George Martin. As McDonald notes, Ringo's soulful vocal performance and the sweeping instrumentation mean that listeners often suppose the song to be a McCartney piece, akin to the knowing style of Martha My Dear or Honey Pie. Ringo Starr's second and final composition for the Beatles, Octopus's Garden, feels like a deliberately crafted cousin to the Ringo-led Yellow Submarine. This family-friendly, joyful, and willfully silly number appeared on 1969's Abbey Road, the last album the group would record together. While the song's Little Mermaid-esque lyrics of happiness and freedom under the sea paint a utopian vision, the fact is that Octopus's Garden was composed during a period of great turmoil. Most accounts of the Beatles' breakup focus on the private and public walkouts by John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison. But in truth, Starr was the first Beatle to quit the band, 
storming out of the White Album recording sessions as his anger at an increasingly controlling McCartney, who had openly insulted Ringo's drumming, hit an all-time high. Ringo fled London entirely for several weeks and basked in the sun of the Italian island of Sardinia, where sitting by the ocean he became deeply interested in the unique behavior of sea creatures. According to Ian MacDonald, given what a tense period of Ringo's life was transpiring at the time, he may have even envied the animals for their seemingly carefree lifestyles. In 2022, Starr told Jimmy Kimmel that a boat captain told him that an octopus would gather pretty rocks to make a garden, which blew his mind. Well, when you're stoned, that's the best idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I go, what? On his return to the band at Abbey Road Studios, where he found his drum kit bedecked with flowers as a gift from his apologetic bandmates, Ringo introduced the song to his fellow Beatles and worked with George Harrison to get it into shape for recording. 